Right, welcome everyone to Cartographer Office Hours. Um, we're glad that you're here for watching the recording. Remember the goal of this space is mainly to discuss RFCs and any other idea you may have to keep improving the project. For today's session, I guess that I can take notes. <clears throat> Um, so it will be David Bell. Okay, uh, and I'm glad to see new faces, Mr. Thomas Vitali. Welcome, Thomas. Yes, this is the first time I see you in this session. Really glad to see you here. All right. Thank you. Cool. All right. Um, great. Again, I will I will share the link for the notes and agenda. Oh no, that's not the correct one. Um, here in the chat, this is the one. So feel free to add your. I just lost. We just lost audio, David. You went mute. Yeah, sorry. This thing moved and went mute. Sorry. So yeah, if your affiliation is with VMware, you just need to add your name. If uh, from other organization, just add your org there to the affiliation list. Okay. Um, great. Cool. So we could start by reviewing outstanding RFCs, but. Um, Seems like there's a priority RFC. The goal of this table here is that you may insert here RFCs that that team consider priority uh, to be discussed first. Um, because we have a board with, with all the RFCs with the corresponding status. Uh, but here you could add a priority RFC. So I see here the artifact tracing one. So I guess we could discuss this first. Great. Um, <laughs> they probably something happened with the... Well, I just was um, wondering if... Um, I have a really quick question to put to everyone if Washim is still wanting for... waiting for another person to join before he starts. Okay, so for... if that's okay with you, David, it's just a quick one just to sort of share out. Um, mm -hmm. I've started on an RFC, the RFC, yeah, I, so it's, it's a really rough draft. It's not worth sharing at the moment, but the idea is that we constrain all outputs. Um, so that whenever you take inputs into a resource that they are constrained, they are related to the same, uh, generation of those as outputs elsewhere. Um, so for example, if source generates an image and then at the end you decide you want to spit out the source reference and the image uh, in your config it would be it would be the source that actually caused that image it couldn't possibly be some other and that's how people tend to use tend to use cartographer when they do take more than one input uh, and we thought it probably could just be implied that behavior no need to spit we don't think there's any special cases where people will want to uh, create um, a graph where two inputs to a node are, are unconstrained, that there could be different random var variables from elsewhere. This would be normal in orchestration to allow that sort of thing, but I don't see any reason to do it in choreography. So I just wanted anyone who thought I was wrong about that to let me know, all right, before I get started on the RSC. I'm going to write it anyway because I want it, and I think the implementation works either way, but it feels like if we could just imply that all inputs are constrained, that would be awesome. It'd be the best experience for everyone. That was Wushuma's suggestion, and I think he's right with that one. So that's just for folks to mull on. As, as Rash implied, it's got a big thumbs up from me. It may be a little written TLDR of that. Might, it would help me wrap my head around that, I think. Okay, sure. Yeah. I just didn't want to yeah. take too much time describing it, but uh, 
I will come up with something soon. Yeah, it's probably just what you said, but maybe, yeah, just so I can digest it a little bit. Yeah. Um, where is... Uh, I think the, um, is it possible for me to share my screen? Yeah, sure. So I just, um, uh, to James's point about, um, oh. uh, yeah, go to the <laughs> Git writer and just add a, go to the Git writer as an example. This is, I would have done this. I just didn't want to take up all of the time that you were going to use. <laughs> Yeah, I think just at the, I, I'm not going to dive into all, all okay. the problems. Okay. But yeah, um, we see a lot of, we've seen folks, and we definitely think there are use cases where this last step, the Git writer, is going to want to do something like say, like, hey, here's the SHA that uh, this config that I'm referencing uh, is talking about. Um, but there's no, right now, there's no way for it to reliably have that information. Um, and what we've already seen people do is say like, oh, well, the SHA comes off of the source provider. I'll just grab the value from the source provider. But that this value may have changed between uh, providing a value to the image builder and that like propagating down to the Git writer. Um, and so we need some way, yeah, we, we need to be able to tell, um, each resource, like, hey, what you are, what you are working on right now, uh, it's like based on this config, but also on like a certain image and a certain value. It makes it constrained. It would be the right source. So, could you just click that link there, Washuma? Did I just post it into chat? Oh. Uh, where is chat? And so, demonstrably. This is what it generally looks like when people try to do this. Uh, and what um, what I'm suggesting is that down the bottom of this uh, of this uh, supply chain definition where you see the config, that source is just assumed can only be the same source that entered into that config provider. They're, they're codependent. And that's what we mean by constrained. We're just saying do with that by default. Um, that there is no reason actually for them to ever be did, did anyone would ever really want to say, oh, I want a source that is a totally unrelated source, right? You can make one, but you just wouldn't also make it an input to an image builder, right? And then that could be your unconstrained one. It's unconstrained by, by not being involved in the rest of the path. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Yeah, I, I understand that. Yeah, no. yeah. Yeah, sorry about my English around it. I don't think there's a good language for it, to be honest. No, 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 not at all. Diagrams help, don't they? So yeah, that's, that's all good. Thank you, Rashima. Yeah, no problem. Um, do we? So I was I was trying to drop in like the proper links to the to the notes. So I didn't quite hear. Are we expecting more folks, or should I just dive in? I think Stephen said he was going to be running late and should should be able to attend. I don't know if that's were you waiting for Stephen? Or was that part while you were asking? Yeah. Okay. Um, but I think it, I'm also going to. Yeah, I may circle back and talk with them later, unless other folks have things to talk about. So you want to introduce, <laughs> yeah, you want to introduce the RFCs that you put there in the agenda, right? Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. So, uh, artifact tracing, the what, the why, the how, da, da, da. Um, what is it? So, uh, cartographer, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm not, you, the the RFCs are there. They're uh, they're pretty long. Some of it's kind of uh, duplicative. Um, so instead, I'm going to like talk about this. I'm just going to use this presentation to talk about it at a high level, um, which I think will be more helpful. Um, 
So cartographer supplies inputs to a template. You know, it gets values from the workload, from the supply chain, uh, and it stamps out some object. And then uh, cartographer also reads values from this stamped object, um, and those become outputs. So I've got inputs over here, and then we've got outputs, some fields on this uh, object. Um, and what we're talking about with artifact tracing is just being able to establish the logical relationship of, hey, I've got some object, and I've got these outputs, and I want to I want to say like this particular URL in SHA came from this URL in branch, uh, for example, from the Git repository object or from the KPAC image object. Uh, this image address uh, is related to this particular URL in SHA, um, and uh, Right now, we, we can't do that because you might submit like a bunch of inputs all at once. You might update the object multiple times, and then you'll see this output like changing over time. Uh, so why do we care? Like We can't do it now. Maybe it's OK. Uh, there are two reasons. Uh, one, observability. The other, security. Uh, thinking about observability, uh, it's, it's easy to read the current state of the supply chain. Uh, so when I see the supply chain now, I can just see like, hey, uh, this uh, Git revision, this Git repository has some revision here. The KPAC image has some image. The uh, config uh, is is has defined some Kate's object, but uh, these aren't necessarily logically connected. This Kate's object object, there's no guarantee that it belongs to this that it's uh, reflecting this image. Um, and so artifact tracing is saying, we want to enable a cartographer to uh, establish the causal graph uh, to say like, oh, you know, this was the revision that led to uh, this Kate's object. This was the revision that led to this image, et cetera. Um, these RFCs do not, uh, do not cover the question of how do you, uh, how do you like where do you write that graph where do you write when i say allow for a log uh it does not establish where do you write that log uh that is an implementation detail there is an rfc that we talked about long ago um back then we talked about we referred to it as rfc 18 um and once we establish that like cartographer can do this reasoning then we then we can move on to the question of, OK, it can do the reasoning. Now we should write what it has reasoned about. Um, so that's observability. Uh, the other thing that we want to talk about is security. Um, so cartographer submits object definition, definitions to the cluster, but uh, we're, we're really only relying on RBAC to help us out with uh, new definitions. Uh, or sorry, to, to we're only relying on RBAC to make sure that our supply chain is not corrupted. Uh, I argue that it would be better to be able to write a secure supply chain on top of an unsecure system rather than to say cartographer's security is only as good as the underlying system's uh, security. Uh, and I believe that that's possible with artifact tracing. Uh, so what's the problem right now? Uh, we already do a little bit of uh, the assurance that the object is in a good state. Uh, if we come across an object and we say, hey, somebody's changed this definition and it wasn't me, we'll change the definition back. But that's not enough to prevent rogues, uh, rogue outputs from propagating through the system for some amount of time. Uh, so to see an example of this, let's say we've got uh, something like KPAC uh, where we uh, we pass it in some good source code, and then a rogue actor comes in and uh, reapply applies some rogue source code, uh, and then cartographer later comes back and says, "Oh wait, no, that's that's rogue inputs. I'm going to establish the the uh, the good source code uh, is there." Uh, what will happen today? Well, the good the good spec will propagate. Uh, and the status will still be unknown. You know, uh, throughout this whole process, there's been no output. Um, and the status will be unknown, and we'll see some good image. It'll be the good image from this original first good source code. And then we could see, uh, oh, status is still unknown. And you could see, ah, this rogue image still comes, because it, you know, it had this definition. It, it picked up that definition, and it propagated it forward. And then later, we would see, oh, the good image uh, happens. It's, the system is eventually consistent, uh, but that is 
that may not be enough of a guarantee. Um, and so we want to give our users uh, some ability to toggle and say, I don't want an eventually consistent CI-CD system. I want a CI-CD system that is strongly consistent. Um, so yeah, with our artifact tracing, cartographer can determine that an output did not originate from its own input because we can associate outputs to inputs. Cartographer would ignore rogue uh, outputs. Uh, there is a question, how do we do this? Uh, and it depends. Uh, there are different types of resources in the world, and there are three cases that really interest us. One is, what if an object just told us the tracing information that we wanted? We should leverage that. That would be wonderful. Um, another is, what if an object told us the equivalent of the artifact information that we wanted, but not uh, exactly in, uh, in the phrasing that uh, we plan for in number one? And the third is, what if an object doesn't help us out at all? Um, uh, what do those look like? Well, uh, one is resources where you might see uh, an output, some latest good, uh, and it provides that value that we're going to read. And then there's just a field, and it says, hey, the inputs, uh, there was some URL, there was some revision. Uh, that's case one. Case two is, well, maybe it provides not, uh, not specific inputs, but just a generation number um, of the spec that led to this output. Um, and the last one, it provides nothing. Uh, so we see that here. Um, so we can take these one by one. Uh, we'll start with the easiest, inputs provided with the outputs. Uh, all we need to do is save the info that we're told. It's super simple. Uh, we can just have a log file. Uh, you know, This URI, URI ABC resulted from URL uh, www.g.com and revision one, two, three. Boom, we're done. Uh, that is artifact tracing. Um, and, and, and we don't have to do anything else. We can just read it off the file. Uh, but if we, want, uh, if we want that security guarantee, uh, we will have to do something, uh, one more thing, which is we'll need to cache the inputs that we submitted. Uh, so if we say that we submitted revisions one, two, three, and four, five, six, and ABC, and then we see this source revision five, six, seven, uh, we can say, oh, that is a rogue output. Uh, we will not propagate that forward through the system. Uh, we therefore achieve our two goals, observability, it's obtained trivially, read it off the object, and security by caching and comparing. We ignore up, uh, outputs of rogue inputs. Uh, um, let me so, pause right there. Yeah. Yeah. Can you go back? Can you go back one? Yeah. Yep. Nope. And again. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, Source revision could be something unrelated because it's a source template. It can spit out anything it likes, and that could still be valid. I think what you're suggesting is that if you're suggesting in cases that this is the happiest case when the input should match the output, where the uh, where the re resource is one that is providing that information that we want. So here. And this this uh, this input field is nested under the latest good field, so this is a resource where they are specifically saying, "I'm I'm going to based tell you, on this input, right? Yeah, th this output okay. came from this input, and this right this relies completely on uh, resource authors being on board with this pattern that we're that telling we're about. what the spec looked like in those days, right? Yeah, yeah, which I think is not very idiomatic, not terribly normal. It's the bit where, which makes me wish that the historical record of generations would be like a default thing. Mm -hmm. Right. But yeah, okay, understood now. Thank you. Sorry. That is a great transition because <laughs> we have any to talk about. With Shuma, do we have any examples of resources that do this today? Uh, I would say the closest that I can think of is uh, Tekton. If you look at a Tekton uh, task run, it will have in its output the definition of the task, the spec of the task run when it ran. Um, and I think that's largely because technically right. you could update the spec of the task run, but it wouldn't, uh, it's not going to rerun or anything. So it's just like, oh, like <laughs> here's the canonical place where you should figure out like what, what was used to run this task run. Okay, so we have the params that were passed into it, so that allows for the tracing out of the box. 
Yeah. Okay. Although we translate it before we use that tecton object anyway, <laughs> using runnable. Yeah, quite yeah. so. So it's the least likely scenario. So I was wondering how much overlap this has with some of the things around attestations, salsa provenance, and some of the other probably open source projects that we're also working in this area as well. Do you see those overlap? Uh, overlap, yes. I think that uh, one of the things that is uh, something that I, I think is necessary is to say we want sort of attestation at the like the high level top level attestation and then be able to dive into the lower level uh, the, the, that lower level um, document uh, provenance or attestation information that those resources provide um, at the cartographer level uh, all we can say is hey I submitted this information to this controller <laughs> and it gave me back uh, this this other stuff. Uh, I think that that has value um, for the, you know, to be able to say at that system level, like uh, what, what uh, you know, you, I, I plugged in all these different uh, pieces to your system. Uh, what, when you were responsible for moving values between those pieces, uh, what did you do? Um, and then there's definitely it's definitely crucial that those individual pieces are going to have much more in-depth information about what they did. And I don't think that uh, this this in no way is meant to replace uh, the sort of attestation that KPAC would have to do, where it details like here's here's the information about how I turned that source code into an image. Does that make sense? I think it does. It's just I guess where my head's going is, um, you know, do we? I guess are we saying that so this wouldn't it by itself wouldn't enable attestations because you're saying the individual components need to be part of that part of yeah, that whole it, approach. So, at the end of the day, um, yeah, th this doesn't prevent you from stamping out uh, or or from bringing in bad. Uh, bad controller X. Cartographer can tell you, hey, I gave bad controller X this input and it gave me this output, um, but it's still going to be important to interrogate that controller to ask it like, what exactly did you do? Yeah, yeah okay. So I was just trying to understand the scope of it. If it, if the feature we're talking about artifact tracing is not attestations, so we still need to solve that problem around attestations yeah. Yeah. Do we see that this is maybe some building blocks towards that goal? Do you think? I think that this is this is necessary for that um, that top level uh, observability because uh, it becomes difficult to trace this. It, it becomes difficult to trace back, uh, like what attestation. If if I'm looking at this, sorry, let's let's say like okay. at this point today. I get this Kate's object and I say, okay, I've got this Kate's object and this came off of the config. Um, and then I could dive into that. Uh, yeah, depending on how, how things are indexed in that controller, maybe they're not even indexing on outputs. Maybe they're indexing on inputs and they're like, oh, if you wanna know what happened with this input, Give me the, give me an input definition, and so you need to provide some image. And right now, you wouldn't even know what image to to say like, oh, image X Y Z. What did you do with that? Does that make sense? I think so. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I think it was more around what the, the aims for this, what we use it for, and what's the you know from that level. Um, and if this, I mean, having a goal around salsa and provenance and attestations is something that. It keeps coming up, and I was just wondering if this is related to if it's not what are the what, what do people use to build on top of this? You know, sorry, what what are people get getting from this? Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering then, if, top of my head, if that isn't if they're not related, then is that something we also need to consider, uh, Rash? I think this is about debug for first and foremost. Right. I think the first goal that you're trying to solve with this is 
helping people understand what's happening, right? Rationalizing about the behavior of the supply chains they're designing, knowing that they can have trust in what they have designed, which then leads to, well, can I trust the attestation of a certain thing, right? Yeah. What am I attesting for? That's a, it could answer that, but it's lower down the rung than I can just even debug to get to that point. I would say two, two use cases really jump out at me. Um, one of them is if you're building a UI on top of uh, Cartographer, uh, users probably care. Hey, I made some, I made some change to my code. Where is it right now? Like, has it gotten all the way through or not? Nice. Um, and so that's that's observability. Um, and as I said, um, the other piece is security. That like right now, eventually we know that uh, Cartographer will output uh, good configuration for your cluster. But right now, it's possible that you have trend. If you had a rogue actor that that had permissions that it wasn't supposed to have, uh, and they altered a KPAC, you know, if they altered any of those objects, uh, it would uh, it would be it, it would be possible for them to uh, have the CI CD output a transient uh, configuration on the cluster that's bad. So I don't think we should allow that. So the idea here is not so much attestation, but the fact that it says cartographer won't let it generate that output from something that isn't that isn't a valid input. I still haven't seen proof that you can do this yet, which you know, but continue. <laughs> well, I, uh, I hope that I've convinced you that if the inputs are in the outputs, that that you, could, you get yes. the security. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, yeah. Great. Let's move on to the next case. Um, I kind of related, uh, Rash, you were talking about observe ge about generations, and uh, I think that this is actually what we should be using. Um, or what we should be encouraging as a pattern in the K2 ecosystem, uh, where with your uh, latest good output, the, the input is some generation of the spec. Um, so why? Why do I say that? Um, a, a resource spec is full of fields. A template, you know, any cartographer template is going to vary some subset of that field. But it's not clear that the resource author, the people that write KPAC images, are going to agree with the template author, like the app operator who's writing some template that wraps KPAC image, that the only important update inputs are some given subset. It's much more likely that the, that the resource authors will say, all of these inputs matter. <laughs> all the fields on the spec matter. <laughs> That's why I put them there. Um, and so we should, it would make much more sense to say, well, let's expect that resources report all inputs. Um, and rather than just have a list of all the inputs, I mean, really just replicate the spec, just use the generation. The, the, that, that's, what, that's what the generation is short for. Um, so here we can see uh, what we would do, we, we would uh, cache, uh, you know, we would submit a template uh, the template would uh, have some inputs. We would then, uh, when we submit it to the cluster, the cluster would give us back an object and that would have uh, fields, uh, metadata dot generation. And we just cache that generation along with the, the input fields that we care about. Um, so in our cache, we'd have gen three, revision four, five, six, gen four, revision one, two, three. And then later we can read this object and see, oh, it says this is observed generation four. We'll say, ah, this URI ABC uh, came from revision one, two, three. Where's that cache? That, uh, yeah. so, oh, sorry, Rash, I didn't see it. Yeah. Sorry, well, I mean, yours. Rash, yeah, yours please. is a way harder. Yours is a way harder question to answer. So start with mine, because uh, mine's not a question. Mine was a point. Am I the only person who, when they first came to Kubernetes and saw observed generation and and the generation field, thought that that meant there was a historical record of of specs like I, that's that's what i thought was about to happen and i never saw it and i was like that's disappointing because that's useful information that helps me know this kind of thing right yeah i'd say that i start no historical information you know community resources can't be relied upon for historical uh, information that needs to be persisted outside the cluster no i mean what i'm saying is that i thought at the etcd level or the key store level that they would keep some sort of like historical record of 
of specs per generation so that you could historically step back. It just, it's a pattern that is almost implemented here, which is I have a version database, but I'm only gonna show you the latest version. That's what was surprising. Not that that's how Kubernetes is, because it isn't, clearly it isn't, but that was the surprise for me. When I saw generations, I thought, ah, oh, so they're keeping some kind of historical database, like some time, time series I guess database. It, yeah, I guess it just can't be reliable. If you remove a CRD or, you know, you know, how you, know, you remove everything within there, so all the historical information gone. That's okay. The, the idea is that it's while it's alive, there's meaning to that generation, right? That's what I was surprised by. I think it's more about storage and, and whatever else came with that, but yeah. Mm. It's, un, it's unrelated. It's not something we get, we have to implement it ourselves, right? But it's kind of surprising. Yeah. No. Yes, that's um, why they didn't choose version. Uh, I, it, you mentioned that last week and I went searching. I haven't seen anything, any discussions on why that isn't there. Um, but yeah, I, it does seem reason, it seems reasonable to me. <laughs> um, James, to, to your question on where the cache exists, um, that is at the end of this presentation. So if I can, if you can, don't mind waiting, uh, yeah, no, because I, the, uh, the la the uh, sort of the last sort of object uh, where it provides inputs needed caching. This one needs caching, and uh, surprise, surprise, the next pattern will also need caching. So, um, uh, so yeah. So uh, hopefully, I've convinced you that uh, if the you know, if we have an object like this where the observed generation is provided with the uh, with the output. Uh, we hit both of our goals. We can construct a graph of inputs and outputs, and uh, we can achieve security by saying any generation that is not in our cache, we just ignore, we don't propagate forward. Um, pausing for questions. All right, let's go ahead. Um, how, Washuma, yeah. how would that affect something like KPAC, though, which may do a build out of band? because it's going to do it based off of a build pack changing underneath. Will that give me it's a the new same generation, generation, isn't it? No, no. It, 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 sorry. Uh, notice got yes to rash. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, you can have multiple outputs from the same generation and we should expect that, that's okay. Generations are about right. the, the state of the spec. If the spec is unchanged, the generation should not be changed. It's the, I mean, that is the, the canon here, at least a, a very solid I idiom. Okay, cool. I'm curious about something maybe mm -hmm. I missed earlier. Uh, in, in this, the observed generations are all tied to individual uh, outputs. So like your resource could have multiple outputs with different generations. Um, the, you know, I think I've seen that occasionally, um, but I, it's, I've probably seen a pattern more where the status has one observed generation as representative of spec. Um, I think we can still use that the same way, right? You know, we don't we don't need to force individual output observed generations if there are multiple outputs. Um, but I just wanted to double check. Again, I missed the beginning, so if you covered that, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I did not cover that. Um, it will be incumbent. I think one, it will be incumbent upon the template author to understand uh, the. Uh, how observed generation is being was implemented by a particular resource. Um, in in the RFC, it says that it's uh, if a if a user is reaching towards uh, status dot observed generation uh, for, uh, for for this, they're almost certainly wrong because uh, that generally is not tied to uh, the latest good output. Um, uh, and I would liken this more to. Uh, the observed generation field that we see in meta v1 conditions, um, where there, if you read the, if you read it, it says uh, uh, the observed generation here relates to the generation that caused uh, this condition to switch to its current value, um, and so for for each condition, like there's there's something there. I think that if you had a, let's scoot it back over here. If you had something like uh, oh, I'm in presentation mode, so I can't change this at the moment. But um, yeah, I, I think if you had a latest good and it wasn't just URI, it was like URI and revision and 
message, uh, it would be fine to have that, uh, to have some uh, object or multiple fields and all of that to have this one input. Um, so it, it's not that every, that every output needs, if you're outputting three different kinds of information, uh, I don't argue that you need three separate observed generations, but I do think that you will yeah. almost certainly need a different observed generation than status dot observed generation. So I think my concern is that everything, or it, it's a relatively common pattern to implement uh, providing an output somewhere in status, providing an observed generation that references the specs observed generation, right? And providing conditions that are observable to let you know, you know, whether essentially the spec is reflected in the status at you know, in combination with observed generation. And then with those three things together, we could do, you know, tracing. Um, I don't see a, an edge case that, you know, prevents that from working. I think what the thing that you've proposed, you can do that. You're just worried that in some cases it's not going to be accurate. You're not saying that it's not possible to use that. There's something different about the model that you're proposing that would make it you know, so that you couldn't use status.observe generation to form the association. Um, I think more uh, what you were just describing, um, where you're saying you, you can use these three pieces of information to reason and and make sure that these inputs are outputs. I think that that's going to be synonymous with that third approach that I'm offering. Um, and I certainly agree. Um, and right here, in the same way that uh, generations with inputs provided was kind of hypothesizing, what if we lived in a world where we didn't have the performance hit? Uh, what, what if we lived in a world where people gave us more information and utilized this new pattern? Got it. So, so the thing I'm talking about is covered. It's just covered. You're going to talk about it later. Yes. Is that the, okay, good. Sorry, I didn't mean to, to interrupt too much then. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, I mean, I just wanted to say like, something that we have been sort of like circling on is I think we want to be, we want to be out there in the CICD world talking about what are great behaviors for resources that live inside CICD. This is what I keep trying to submit to this KubeCon, try and get a talk accepted where I can go and talk about, oh, well, what is it to be a good actor in a CICD scenario on a Kubernetes cluster, right? And, and this here is the, this here I think is the goal to advertise to people, tell us about an output and what spec it matches. It's going to be the nicest thing that you could possibly do. All right. It doesn't mean that it happens. It just means that it'd be great. Yeah, it definitely makes sense. So to, uh, yeah, <laughs> I love when I'm giving a presentation and folks are like, what if we did this other thing? And I'm like, oh, it's here. <laughs> Um, so, to what Stephen was talking about, um, what if they just don't provide us anything? Uh, you know, it's it's the way most CRDs are today. Um, uh, there's, we've got to wait. Um, we know that if generation equals observed generation, and the condition, if there's some top level condition, that in generally there is, um, where it just says uh, everything that I know about the spec and the state of the world. Like I've done everything that needs to be done, and I'm at rest. That doesn't mean that like something else. You know, there might be some perturbation in the universe that that changes things. So, for example, there might be new KPAC base images, or there might be new commits to a branch uh, in uh, Git, uh, and so that KPAC image or that Git repository may change on that same generation. But for right now, it's at rest. Um, if we see these two things, then we can say, hey, the the current output is the result of the current spec. Um, the so yeah the, the saying like take take this our source revision is written into the spec but there's oh sorry yeah so one question is is it sufficient to just hold rights um it is not um and so why not uh the the source revision is something that's written into the spec uh and you know this will update this from time to time the base image definition is something that exists out in the universe separate from uh, the spec that we that we define it, it gets updated uh, without our observing it, uh, and so there's quite if we can see that we could have a concurrent update of source revision and this base image definition, and let's say that the base image 
uh, updates an instant before the source does. That we we're not able to observe. Like we've we've already done a read. We saw ready is true, and then we're saying, okay, I'm going to do a write. Now we can do atomic writes. It's totally possible to say, hey, when I submit this, make sure that I'm submitting with this like the spec hasn't changed. But again, this base image definition isn't the result of a change to the spec. There's no way to make that atomic change and say, uh, you know, if something else has changed in the universe, then then uh, allow me to then you should fail this write. It, it has to be atomic. Uh, and so as a result, we see uh, two new outputs. We see image generation n with the new base image. And then we see the uh, input generation n plus 1 with the new base image. And But because we didn't know about this, uh, what the most likely thing that we would do is reason, oh, well, I gave it a new input. So this is input generation n plus 1. And there was and it gave me the based on the base image. And then there must have been an update. There was a new base image. And that's input generation n plus 1. Um, and so there's there's not enough information for us to uh, disambiguate between these unless we wait for uh, for the system to settle and to only read when ready equals true. Um, so uh, yeah, so we must hold reads until the controller has an output for the current spec. So read only when uh, generation is observed generation, ready equals true. Uh, there is an issue of starvation. Um, if updates happen faster than reconciliations, uh, the, that can starve the supply chain. So we have to hold update, we have to hold reads and we have to hold writes. Um, so we can only write uh, uh, if the system is at rest. Uh, one thing to note is that uh, ready can equal true or ready can equal false in that case. Um, the you know the pros, hey, we avoid starvation and it guarantees artifact tracing. The cons is that we'll skip updates in that case. So if at time zero we submit update one uh, and it's going to take ten seconds to complete uh, or ten ticks. Uh, at time three we we have update two, we'll just, the cartographer won't stamp that out because things are in an unknown state. Uh, update three comes in at time seven. We won't stamp that out because things are in an unknown state. Uh, at time nine, a new update comes in. And uh, we see that uh, it, it waits. And then at time 10, when this completes, uh, then update four will be applied. So these two will be skipped over. Um, I would say that we have uh, examples of uh, CRDs that operate like that, KPAC, for example, if you submit multiple uh, inputs, uh, there is only one build going at a time, and uh, it will toss out old, like, it, it'll only submit the newest one when it's ready to create a new build. Uh, I see Rash and then Steven and then so other questions. Why, yeah, my, my question is what examples do we have in the world that we need to do this? Because in the case of like KPAC, KPAC's going to hold on the first write. And when it's done, it'll take the latest thing it got. So why do we need to hold it up? Uh, it's not clear to me that we can rely on that with our logic. Like, no, it, 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 there's, there's no way for, for us as cartographer to know that every resource is going to behave in that manner. So we could. Uh, uh, we could behave as if that is the case, but if there's any if there's any object out there that you say, uh, I, say I mean, actually, runnable, but right? the, well, runnable, runnable doesn't behave like that. Uh, we're not we're not holding the rights to enforce that behavior that you're talking about, where things um, kind of build serially, right? We're holding rights so that we can wait for it to settle, whatever kind of resource it is, so that we can observe the correlation between input and output without getting those inputs overridden so that we end up starved for uh, you know, a thing that we can correlate to allow it to progress forward. I, I don't know, did that make sense? <laughs> or what, I, I think I'm not buying I, I understood what. <laughs> I'm not buying it because as soon as you put in a new one, you change your observed generation. 
as soon as you change your input spec, you get a new. Right, so the so only starvation don't... cause here could be if a lot of images got created um, that I can think of with KPAC specifically. S say somebody's uh, committing rapidly, right? Uh -huh, yeah. And it's it's updating um, a KPAC image spec over and over right. and over again, right? And yep. we're not holding off on those rights. Then we would never, we might never be able to observe a correlation between an input and an output, right? In that case. It, which is two slides back where we do that, where we check to see if ready, true, and... Um, but that's never going to be true, right? Yeah, in that case. The update, the observed generation will get bumped. So the idea is to hold the inputs so that one can be successful before yeah. we write to it. Oh, it's so inefficient. Okay. That's why we need to argue for the second, the second case, right? The nice thing is that everything already kind of implements this. And so <laughs> if, we impl if we have this as an option, as the least preferable option, but as an option, then we get a lot of compatibility with the ecosystem. And I know, like I understand. It's just that it's the, only, it's the only one that's going to be going now, and it is already less efficient than what we have today in the sense that we don't hold today, right? I think, I mean, for me, one reason it doesn't bother me too much is with you know, KPAC's behavior of the serializing everything, it doesn't really make KPAC any less efficient. It means KPAC sees less source code, but in the end, KPAC is going to continually build images, you know, one after another into the future, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that, that skipping of updates is like, it's a part of a level triggered system, right? It's like like how this type of thing, or it's, it's an oh. expectation of the type of thing we're building. And so, it, you know, that compromise doesn't bother me that much. Personally, I mean, I'm not saying we shouldn't argue about it still. <laughs> it's just can we go? Mind. Can we go back one one slide for a sec, please, Mushima? This, this one, one here, yeah. though, where it's like uh, already false, right? Mm -hmm. Um. What What about ready unknown? So, if if ready's unknown, we we shouldn't update. We should we should let we should let things complete. Right. And then once they've completed, we can say like, "Hey, I can read an output off of there, and now I can now I can submit something." All right. But if it's oh oh sorry, it's hard to read this one. Sorry, the logic here finally ticked over for me when the when the generations are matching, um, and we prevent writes until it's false or true. It's completed a step. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, so uh, one thing that I, I mentioned that, uh, you know, all these approaches need, need caching. This one needs uh, two caches. Uh, you know, sometimes we can't read a current value, so we need to cache the value that we're reading. Um, but also sometimes we can't write the most recent templated definition, so we need to template, we need to cache the definition we expect to be on the cluster. Um, so uh, you know that that piece I was just talking about. Uh, currently, we're doing this in memory. Like, we uh, submit an object to the cluster. We check and see, like, hey, is this? Uh, uh, right. I I see. Uh, David said five minutes left. So I'm going to skip over this. Uh, it's it's useful. Uh, just know we need to uh, we need to uh, cache uh, both the spec that we submit. Uh, so that we can continue to ensure that it's the one that's on the cluster, and we need to cache the outputs because when that object is spinning, we won't be able to read the output off of it. We'll need to, we'll need to read it off of some some cache that we've specified. Um, I've been uh, using ready equals true as a shorthand, uh, but I don't think that we should actually uh, hard code that in. We should just use health rules. We have definition for health rules. Uh, you know, uh, Sam has. Uh, been uh, working super hard to to make sure that that's implemented. Uh, and uh, in the in the RFC, uh, I received some feedback that maybe users would want to have different health rules for the top levels. Like, is this object healthy? And the like, is this ready to pass information on? Um, I, so I've I've written it so that you have two separate health rules fields. Um, I. Because I'm amenable to that, not be, it's not clear to me that that's actually necessary. But I'm totally amenable. Um, uh, yeah, 
So I argue that at this point, uh, we have uh, achieved our two goals, that we read up, uh, outputs are always correspond to the inputs, the, you know, they're just what was the, you can read, hey, here's the spec, here's the output, uh, ready is true, and it's the same generation, uh, this spec led to this output. Um, and also rogue outputs will never be read off because cartographer will always ensure that spec, uh, if, if it's changed, we'll flip it right back, and then we'll just wait until things are in a good state again. Um, that that's like the broad overview, and then the last couple of slides talk about the caching, and like what you know, what do I think, where do I think that cache is? Are there any questions about these approaches before I talk about that? I just got that last one. When you say cache to spec, you really just mean the inputs, right? Like you mentioned earlier. Um, that is, uh, that's likely good enough. I think the one thing that we would see. Um, if we if we did just if we did do just that, uh, and then the template changed, then we would uh, we would see like a little more churn in the system, which we could probably handle. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean it's a it's a survivability cache, right? Uh, when you say uh, survivability in terms of if the system went down yeah uh so, somewhat although we're not just using it for survivability well, we've also got facts about what happened right if the template changes then the template um the template should end up causing a new gen as far as i can tell so i don't see the you know that that's the right thing that should happen anyway i uh, yeah, I, I'm, I am amenable to arguments that we should treat changes to cartographer objects different from changes to outputs from the underlying uh, objects in the system. Um, but I don't know that there's any example where we do that yet. So I haven't, I haven't hypothesized about doing that here. I guess my point is simply that if, if today you had some inputs, um, you know what Gen two created you. If someone changed the template, you would have a Gen three. So you don't you got new inputs for that one. So you would cache them, and then still you don't need the spec. You just need the the things that we need to know about as inputs. Hmm. Yeah. Anyway, it's technical yeah. detail. I don't think we need to go into it too deeply. If you want to get onto your caching stuff. Yeah. Um, and David, I appreciate your forbearance here. <laughs> um, there are, so where's the cache? I think there are broadly four options uh, in memory, in the status of the workload, in a separate object on the cluster, and in a data store. Uh, they all have uh, you know, some strengths and drawbacks. Uh, in memory, we probably need something that, what Rash was just talking about, survivability. Like We should expect that the controller will go down sometimes. Um, in the status of the workload, the workload's already very long. <laughs> Um, uh, I worry not so much about the, um, there's a one megabyte limit. I don't worry so much about that as I do about the, uh, about just readability, but maybe that ship has sailed. Uh, in a separate object on the cluster, I think it's a good idea. Um, and uh, then we could just do it, put in a data store, like have some database on Kate's or off. Uh, Sorry. Steven. We're thinking about that separate object um, in the context of blueprints. So like, it, as we think about, rethink that descriptor, um, the you know amount of stuff in status makes that descriptor not especially user-friendly, right? And so, and if we wanted to, you know, folks to be able to bring their own descriptor that's not even like, um, you know, intended to be used with the system, right? Like they want to reconcile against a config map or something like that, right? You could imagine something, you know, something like that being useful in an operator operator context, right? Then we really would need some other kind of storage there. And so I wonder if there's a, a touch point between blueprints and <laughs> this where, you know, we can make a decision that works well in both cases. Hmm. Uh, it'd be, yeah, I think there's reading that I need to do to get up on the current the current blueprint stuff, but I'm happy to do to do so. I think we also just need to be careful about pre-dependency on stuff that's not done because I think this work needs to happen. More importantly, is that if we if we ended up with anything to tomorrow, which one do we need 
more. Blueprints. Well, I'm going to say my idea. So. <laughs> <laughs> Blueprints, huh? Yeah. Uh, I think that's. I think that's. Maybe, maybe it's a separate conversation. I, I think yeah, because part of that separate conversation is yes, we might want that more tomorrow, but you won't get it tomorrow. So, <laughs> right. Some of the reality behind implementation. My guess is we'll be working on both of these relatively concurrently, if that okay. makes sense. Um, All right. um, yeah, the, the only final thing to say about the cache is, um, you know, when we talk about a separate object, it could be a config map. Uh, they're well understood. But my concern is that I would just expect lots of people to have permission to alter config maps. And altering it would mean uh, like really disrupting the behavior of the supply chain. So I think we would just need some custom cartographer object that we just call it the carto config map. Um, I think, that's, I think that's a, just, yeah. Sorry, I, should, I think on one of those, what would be good to understand is probably what size these grow to, uh, the number of them, what the payload inside these as well. My, one of my concerns around is just the growing number of resources and using more and more resources to store things, which a lot of people do, which is good. But if there is going to be thousands of these, that has a, does have an impact on the performance of clusters with lots of applications creating their own resources. Just something else to be aware of. Yeah, mm -hmm. I suspect you would end up with something on the order of um, the, the length of your, if you take the length of your supply chain as N and the number of workloads as M, you would get M times N of these objects. Oh, you're thinking of, you're thinking of one per resource. I uh, yes, I'd divide by I, N. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, that's fair. You could, you could try to do it with, uh, you know, every, like one entire logical supply chain has one, one object for that cache, um, wow. but, you know, and Instance then it of becomes workload like a, is what it I can. becomes larger. So uh. I just think it's what n for workload, and that's it. That's mm -hmm. how I'm seeing it. It doesn't need to be divided by n and m. I don't think we need one for all the cartographer, but yeah. sorry, <laughs> sorry. When I, when I say logical supply chain, I I'm saying workload. That, that's right. the way I'm saying. It. Okay. <laughs> sorry, yep. I need my translator on. Uh, it's all good. <laughs> Get outside of my own head. <laughs> Uh, but uh, David, I am done. That is, that is everything cool. that I wanted to present. No, first, thank Weshima, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to build this presentation to introduce uh, three RFTs uh, in a in a very clear presentation. Thank you for doing that. Could you please drop the link for the presentation in the chat so I can add it to the notes? Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you all for attending. One last thing, we have Thomas here again. Um, Thomas, thank you. You'll be presenting this week on go to at the, the go to conference in beautiful Denmark, right? If there's uh, anything, yes, that's correct. Cool. So, so first, thank you for doing that, Thomas. Um, the the link for the for his presentation it's in the notes and I will add it here also. Um, again, if you need something from the team, if you have any question feel free to reach out. Uh, if there's anything we can do to help for your session, it will be awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I'll definitely share uh, Yeah, what I've been working on. Uh, also, hopefully it can be useful for the project also for uh, like, uh, yeah, sharing the word about Cartographer. I'm a really, uh, really big fan of the project. So I'm uh, happy I get to, uh, yeah, show it to people uh, this week. I'm not sure if the, uh, conference is recorded but if it is then of course i'll share the video uh, with you and let you know sure of course thank you thank you so much thomas and yeah of well course. thank you all for attending and uh yeah hope to see you next week thank Bye. you <laughs>